And please welcome my candle lighter. She's out from behind the soundboard. Amy! <laughs> she did such a great job last Sunday. So, so we're an interfaith gathering, a spiritual community that honors all teachings and all spiritual teachers. So we do this ceremony that celebrates this oneness of life, which acknowledges that all peoples and all faiths come from the one universal presence, which we call spirit. And so we begin the Tao, honoring the universal path of harmony and equilibrium, the natural way. Shamanic traditions, honoring the beliefs and practices of all indigenous peoples, the way of pristine spirituality. Hinduism, honoring the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Judaism, honoring the ethical path of living by sacred law. Buddhism, honoring the four noble truths and the path of compassion. Christianity, honoring the Christ consciousness as the path of love. Islam, honoring the path of submission to the will of God as the highest calling. New thought, honoring the metaphysical path of mental healing through the practice of universal spiritual principles. And then of course the last candle is our healing candle of love. And we invite you in the stillness of your own mind to bring to awareness the names of anyone, anyone, you wish to be included in this healing flame of love and of light. And now that our flames of faith are fully lighted, we move forward into our celebration, realizing and reaffirming that all paths lead to God. Thank you, Amy. 25 years ago, uh, a man and his adult son, young adult son, entered a bicycle challenge. This challenge was in Vietnam. It went from Hanoi to Saigon. Uh, 1,200 miles, uh, was in 16 stages, meaning they'd have to do at least 75 miles a day. Um, a very grueling challenge, made even more difficult by the fact that the sun was blind. So they had to ride a tandem bike. They had to pedal in perfect unison. They had to work together as a team um, the father and the son did not always get along real well. They were very different in their personalities. They had different political beliefs. They had different philosophical beliefs. They were very different in many ways. And the son was actually dreading being essentially chained to his uh, father for nine hours a day riding a bicycle. Um, but he went ahead and did it. Um, this was the son's first time to be in Vietnam. It was the father's second time because he had fought in the war. Um, the father was very patriotic and he would missed up at the playing of the national anthem. And the son thought that was kind of corny. And when he was a teenager, his mom died. And he always had felt that dad had never really grieved for mom. Dad was very stoic. He didn't show emotion much. He didn't. He wasn't that kind of guy. A lot of our veterans are that way. But they rode, and as the challenge progressed, the son 
began to develop more of an appreciation for his father. They came to a thing, and I believe it was called the High Van Pass on this trek. It was a rise in elevation of 3,280 feet, compacted into a very short distance. Uh, the worst part of it was a 10-mile stretch uh, of 10% uh, grade, and it just kept getting worse and worse, steeper and steeper and steeper, at average 10%. It was hot, it was humid, and it was extremely difficult. And the son could feel his dad starting to falter. He could feel dad was, was losing some of his strength as they went. And for the first time in his life, he reached up and he put his hand on dad's shoulder and said, dad, we can do this. And that seemed to give dad a real push because never before had he done anything like that. Um, always it had been the other way around as he would take his son hiking, his blind son, he would lead him through the trails and they went and here was the son reaching out to him. And the son decided to dig deeper and to give more. He was going to help dad in this case. They continued barely hanging on and they were nearing the top. They didn't know exactly how far, uh, but they came around a bend and dad saw it was another half mile and he really lost it. You know, he was, he felt defeated and the son could tell, but they kept going and then they began to hear the cheers of the onlookers and that gave them the impetus to keep going and dig it deeper once again and they pressed and they went and with only a hundred yards to go somehow the front tire hit a boulder that had rolled in the road and they fell down hard and they got up and they pushed the bike the last 30 meters to the top. And when they arrived at the top, once again, the son put his hand on his dad's shoulder and said, great job, dad. We did it. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming out today. It's good to see everyone that's here and welcome to those of you who are online. Thank you for the privilege of your time. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful day out there, and uh, it's great to see everybody here. I, I can't continue without mentioning the music. Erin, uh, how does, I don't know how she does it. I, it was absolutely perfect for today. Uh, the lyrics, the special music. Uh, Jessica, that was that was great. In fact, I almost felt like oh, I don't even need to get to give a talk today. We'll just <laughs> sing and we'll go home early and get out in this. But I better do something here. So um, three points today. I always have three points. My three points are, number one, our thoughts are creative. Number two, change the world. And number three, I'm going to talk about the standing stones. The standing stones. Number one, our thoughts are creative. Earlier this week, I uh, was going through uh, uh, BuzzFeed, and there was a, a segment in there on things that people no longer do. They used to do when they were maybe younger, and they reached a place in their life where they don't feel compelled to do those things anymore. And one of them caught my eye. It was a lady that I no longer argue. She says, if somebody has a firmly held belief that two plus two is five, I just say, that's interesting. That's really cool. Thank you so much. You know, have a great day. She says, I no longer argue. Well, that was uh, just a perfect segue for a quote from Plotinus, one of Holmes' uh, uh, favorite authors. Uh, Plotinus wrote, I do not argue. I contemplate. And as I contemplate, I let fall the seeds of thought into the mirror of mind. 
which then becomes the mirror of matter. Thoughts become things. The collective consciousness has taught us to protest, communicate, outrage over situations. And while this may make us feel better and we feel like we're engaged and getting into it, it has proven largely ineffective at really creating a real lasting change. Change needs to manifest in the outer, but it begins on the inner. It begins inside. Making war on the outer circumstances just empowers those circumstances. It's like we talked about the last two weeks. You know, If you focus on worry, you're giving your creative energy to that which you do not want. We believe that there is only one power that behind and within all of the circumstances, no matter how ugly, there is a divine presence. When we commit to seeing things differently, we can create differently. The wise warrior takes a step back and centers themselves prior to entering the fray. Get centered. This gives an opportunity to look past the appearance of things and see the core reality that is present. Once we can see that core reality, we can coax it forward and shift the situation, usually without bloodshed. See, we don't need to have Cali. Instead of getting angry over the situations, we can ask, what do I want to see here instead? Rather than fighting that, focus on what do I want to see? What do I want to feel? What do I want to experience instead of this? What is spirit's highest ideal here? Then we can contemplate instead of arguing. Point number two, change the world. You change the world by changing our thinking. In his book, Yes, You Can Change the World, Aman Matwani invites us to follow a path. The path is an invitation to change how we see the world. We're invited to see the intrinsic worth of every person. This alone shifts our interpersonal relationships. The world's made of relationships. And then he invites us to focus on three practices. The first, focus not on how little time we have, but on how to make the most of what little time we have with every person. Number two, focus not on what you see on the outside of a person, but on the person within. See both the pain and the potential within. That one really struck me. The person that gives me growth opportunities frequently and uh, boy, when I started looking at the wounded child, really made a difference. Uh, thirdly, focus not on what's wrong with a person, but on what makes them right. See their strengths within their weaknesses we're invited to become the change that we want to see in the world. We've been here in that for a long time. It may seem a small thing in the face of what appears to be overwhelming challenges, yet every change starts small and grows. Think of the seeds thrown out by various plants. Jesus used the example of the mustard seed. A few tiny plants can soon occupy a whole hillside. We know that we are one all interconnected, thus seeing the intrinsic worth of each person can create a change that snowballs. And those, the picture that I saw of the seeds walking through Spain, oh, the miles and miles of the most beautiful wildflowers. And there's one, Anne knows the name to it, I don't know that stuff, but it was white and was in bloom as we walked Oh my goodness, uh, the aroma coming off these fields and fields of these magnificently beautiful white flowers was just stunning. And it all begins with one little seed. Uh, somewhere here, oh, Ernest Holmes in Science of Mind wrote, to daily meditate on the perfect life and to daily embody the great ideal is a royal road to freedom. 
Well, when Ernest Holmes invites us to meditate on the perfect life, he's not asking us to meditate on my idea of a perfect life or his idea of a perfect life. He's inviting us to meditate and contemplate on the perfect life, the perfect life. Often this calls for us to surrender our own idea in order to make room for a greater idea. That's what Emerson talked about and when he talked about you know, getting your bloated nothingness out of the way is to allow something greater to come into that space of consciousness. He's telling us the same thing. We all come to a point where our ego or an intellect must finally admit, I don't know how to fix this. Michael Beckwith says, a bad day for the ego is a good day for the soul. When we have to finally bang our head against the stones of life enough, we can turn up to that which is greater than we are. But it is not enough. We can turn to that which is greater. We can turn to the infinite presence and do things my way. No. We have to let go of my way and accept the highway. Okay, third point, the standing stones. These are called meneers. Uh, typically, if there is one standing stone, it's a monolith. If there are more, they're meneers, and they come, you know, they've been found in multiple, multiple uh, configurations. They even have like a classroom. There's one in the front and rows of these standing stones. Um, the most common, however, though, is circular. And, what we think of, or at least I know what I thought of when I started looking into this, is Stonehenge. And what prompted Neolithic man to create these and do this? I mean, first they had to find the stones big enough, and they had to dig a big hole, they had to drag the stones there, build an earthen ramp so they could get it all the way up, tilt the stone over to go in, then bury it again, and they were able to do that with such precision that all of these decades later, we still have the astronomical things of the sun coming through the cracks at exactly the longest day. We don't know why they went to do all that, but some scientists have theorized that they were made to facilitate transitions or transformations. Now, in our movement, we talk a lot about circumstances. And circumstance is simply that which is standing around you. Those are our circumstances. Uh, I'm going to invite you now to join me in a, a little guided meditation. So, you can put your feet on the floor if you feel comfortable can close your eyes or whatever is good, make you feel comfortable. You're on a beach. It's a beautiful day, just like today. You're at the beach. It's warm, but not too hot. You can hear the ocean's waves softly coming to shore. Then you realize that you're kind of warm and decide that you're going to walk into the water and cool off a bit. And so you walk in and, oh, it's just perfect. It's cool. It's not warm. It's not bathtub warm. It's just right. And you walk in and it's so good. You step in and take a few strokes. You swim a little bit. Ah, oh, it's just awesome. And you look up and you look toward to the beach, you know that it's really close. But it's not as close as you thought. And then you realize that you're in a rip, riptide. That the current is taking you away from the shore. So you take a deep breath. And you know the way to get through this is to swim parallel to the shore. And so you begin to swim parallel to the shore. And you swim and it gets faster and harder. The current is taking you out even faster and you don't know if you've, now you're going into the middle of the riptide or if you need to turn around and go back and you don't know what to do and you're confused 
and you're already starting to get tired, you look up and you see three big, strong lifeguards on the beach and they are looking at you and they see what has happened and they jump into the water and with that uh, riptide behind them, they swim so quickly, they reach you, they help you and they tag team off helping you as you go and they get you back to the side, they get you back and they swim back to the beach and you finally arrive at the beach and you are exhausted, your heart is pounding, you're out of breath and you crawl on your hands and knees on the beach and you're just filled with gratitude and you lay there and you just experience that as your breath slowly starts to return. And that is a transition. The long, slow struggle to make things better. But you lay on the beach and slowly your breath starts coming back. You can feel your heart rate starting to go back down. You're starting to feel better. And then you feel something tugging on you again and you roll and you turn. And all of a sudden you wake up and you are in your bed. This entire thing has been a dream. You are dry, you are safe, you are secure. That is a transformation. Transformation comes not through the struggle and extreme effort and heroics on our part. It comes from connecting with the deep but often, often unconscious truth of our being. And so now that you have experienced both a transition and a transformation, I invite you back into this space, this time. And I hope you have a better idea of what I mean by transition and transformation. Years ago, I don't know, what, 15, maybe years ago, a movie came out, it was called The Secret. And The Secret embraces many of the things that we believe and they talk about it. But I almost think that that movie ended up doing more harm than good because people took it at a very superficial level and they thought that they could use the secret for financial gain. Oh, this is how I'm going to get rich. I'm going to follow these principles and I'm going to be rich. And it didn't really work quite that way. A couple of weeks ago, Cynthia had Jennifer make an affirmation for us. I don't think it's really an affirmation, but it sure makes a lot of sense. And I want to repeat that part of it. The function of prayer is not to influence God but rather to change the nature of the one who prays. I don't think that we are going to beg or barter the divine into doing something for us to follow our will. I think that our endeavor in all of this is to open ourselves up to whatever the, the divine presence idea is for us and to follow that. I don't think we're going to talk God into doing anything. <laughs> the wise warrior knows that it is not their power that creates real change. We recognize that we are co-creators with the infinite. You see, the father and his son in that bicycle challenge co-created their situation. They went through a very difficult transition but more importantly, at the end, when his hand went up on dad's shoulder, they experienced a transformation. And they transformed their relationship into one that's deeper and more fulfilling. And that's where we stand in life. We can have relationships that are deeper and more fulfilling. 
Sometimes we have to go through a transition, but I think we can be open to transformation as well. We remember that we are directing the power and that this power is greater than all of the stuff that we have in the world. When we stand as wise warriors, we align with the infinite power of good. It can't just be something that we talk about or even something we do. It gives us the opportunity to be that power of love, harmony, unity. And the good news is, that's already who we are. And so with the awareness of that power, that presence that is God in our lives, I invite the practitioners to join me in holding our congregation, those in physically in the room, those watching live now, those that are watching later, to recognize that that power, that presence is with each and every one of us at every moment of every day. That that infinite presence is absolutely infinite and the infinite includes right now, and right now, and right now. And it is within me, it is within you, it is within each and every one. And that infinite presence has never been sick. That infinite presence has never been broke. That infinite presence has never suffered for love, has never been alone. And we just know that as we turn away from the circumstances, as we turn away from the standing stones, what are blocking us from experiencing that infinite presence, we too can allow that infinite presence to flow through us, on and out. We can just give thanks. We give thanks to that awareness. We give thanks to the power and the presence of the divine. So we just step back, we let it go, we let it be. We pray and move our feet. All praises be unto the one, and so it is.